yes, I'd like to talk to Richard about uh, Bachelor's Grove uh -huh. out in Oak Forest, I believe it is. It's uh, mm, 143rd Street east of uh, Ridgeland. Yes. Um, what are your experiences out there? What have What have you heard? Well, I've heard things, and I have had some experiences. It's one place that I've finally been at the right place at the right time, I mm -hmm. guess, to have an experience. But over the years, and I've been hearing about this, well, since high school days, over the years I've heard many different stories regarding this old little German community farming cemetery. But the cemetery itself dates back to the 1840s. It's next to a, a stream of running water, next to a pond. We have this running water connection uh, pop up in many, many ghost stories. Over the years, I've been hearing things about blue ghost lights, a disappearing house, uh, disappearing cars, all different kinds of things taking place out there, the whole gamut of really unusual and bizarre things. But when it comes to personal experiences, I did have something happen to me twice out there, uh, somewhat similar, uh, both occasions. I was glad it happened a second time, actually, so I felt a lot easier that the first time I was not uh, having... Uh, uh, some kind of a problem coming to grips with what was going on. It really did happen. I'm convinced it really happened the first time when it happened a second. In May of 1977, a friend of mine, Jim Brandon, was in town. Jim had published a paperback, had written a paperback called Weird America, and it's a state-by-state -state guide of unusual sites, strange, haunted, uh, bizarre sites around the United States. Much of the state of Illinois was me, and the material that I had uh, uh, contributed to... Uh, uh, to Jim. Jim lives uh, currently down in the Peoria area, but he was living in Colorado at that time. He was in town. He had mentioned Bachelor's Grove in that book and wanted to see it for himself. He had included it in the book based on uh, uh, just my uh, telling him that it, it certainly was a place worthy of inclusion uh, in, in his what book. What time of day did you go out there, by the way? Well, we drove out there one night, got out there uh, shortly after 9.30 or so, mm -hmm. and we were out there walking around the old cemetery. It was dark out. We were doing nothing but feeding the mosquitoes. It was about it. We didn't uh, see anything, observe anything at all in the cemetery, which was not unusual because I had never experienced anything there before that, although I had collected many interesting reports from people who I believed were credible witnesses. In leaving the place, we began to drive west on 143rd Street. We were just crossing the creek, and on the west side of the creek, on the right-hand side of the road, there was a car parked, and I just swerved a little bit, uh, towards the uh, center strip just to make sure the guy wasn't going to open his door and jump out or something like that. I didn't want to strike the car or anybody getting out nearby just to be on the uh, safe side. As I passed that car, began to pass the car, suddenly there was no more car to pass. The car disappeared. It was a parked car, all dark. It was there one second and gone the next. Well, I, I just hit the brakes in the middle of the road and stopped and I yelled, Hey, Jim, did you see that? Hmm. Now, Jim was facing me talking at the time. I can't even remember what we were talking about. I was just so uh, excited about this. And I said, didn't you see that car disappear? It was a car right there. He was not facing me, did not see it, and to make matters worse, didn't even believe me. <sighs> and it really got to me that he didn't believe me. Here's a guy that had just written a book called Weird America, and <laughs> I brought out to show the place to, and here we were looking for unusual phenomena. Uh, and the night that it happens, I'm with a, I'm with a, a witness who would be a very credible witness, and yet he was facing me, not paying attention, did not see it. He tried to convince me that I was wrong, that I had perhaps seen a, a car in the rearview mirror and just through some lazy mental process had assumed it was at the side of the road. And I kept saying, no, Jim, there's no cars anywhere coming f towards us or behind us. There's nothing on the road. Uh, it was a very quiet moment. By the way, as soon as I stopped and looked at my watch, it was two minutes after 10 o'clock. Uh, there's just no way I could explain it. I hadn't been overly tired. Uh, although we had had a sandwich earlier at an Italian restaurant nearby and had uh, a couple of beers to go with it, a couple of beers doesn't make me see things. Uh, it was just nothing that could explain what had happened. Mm -hmm. A little over a year later, in September of 1978, I was driving down Cicero Avenue east of the site, and when I was nearby, had the time, whenever I'm nearby and do have the, uh, the time, and I always have the inclination, I drove out there to check out the site again. And driving towards the cemetery, backing across the road diagonally, was a car. 
which I presumed to be a squad car, police car, backing into the Rubio Woods Forest Preserve entrance. They do that all the time. They sit there and watch the area or set up radar. And I just automatically assumed that it had to be a squad car, so I watched my speed and just kept looking to the right to see where that car had gone. It took me only a few seconds to get there. When I got there to the Rubio Woods entrance, I was shocked to find that the chain was up over the entrance. There were ditches on either side of the entranceway, nowhere for car to go. That car was not there, nowhere for the car to be. Hmm. That car had to have disappeared also. So the second car, lights on in motion, backing into the uh, drive. The first car, darkened, parked to the side of the road. But both cars disappeared for me just next to this very famous cemetery, Bachelor's Grove. And these are common reports of, of the cars disappearing? Yes, disappearing car reports are common in the area. Uh, these car reports are uh, very, very uh, interesting to me uh, because it's a little bit more unusual and bizarre than your common ordinary people ghosts when you have uh, mm -hmm. inanimate object ghosts you're really starting to get into some uh, these late metal cars areas. the uh, the second car the one that was in motion seemed to be a uh, older car mm -hmm. it was longer and it had uh, the bigger tail lights and so on although the curious thing about it is that you see cars all the time on the road you don't automatically try to figure out the make and model mm -hmm. and when it's gone then it's too late to try to figure out what it is right. in the instance when it's gone then you're, you're trying to rack your brains well just exactly what did it look like what did it seem like that car i could only see the lights up ahead backing across the road and i suppose the silhouette vaguely but uh, not much the first car though uh, seemed to be a, a medium sized uh, smaller Chevy type car, uh, just a squared off car, nothing uh, very fancy, but a, a compact or a medium sized car just parked there at the side of the road. Richard, dark, uh, dark in color and uh, darkened inside. Could I share, share something that happened to me about 15, 16 years ago? At Bachelor's Grove? At Bachelor's yes, Grove. And it, and certainly. It actually uh, ended up on the front page of the Chicago Tribune, and none of us talked about it. Uh, ten of us went out there three in one car and seven in another car and we went out there <clears throat> and it was so dark you know how that entrance uh, has the trees just overlap each other uh -huh. and it was so dark in that access road uh, we got about oh about 30 feet in and all of a sudden everybody else halt and uh, uh, one of the cars was an old um, Hudson and uh, we decided we'd back in. So out everybody goes, and we backed in. And we, uh, Richard, we, we backed in, and we were in high school at the time. Um, Ten kids aged anywhere from 15 to 18. And um, we saw lights. And uh, this, this was the first time at that particular um, site that any of us had ever gone, but we'd heard about this for years. We, we backed in and went as far as we could because there's some logs to go across the road mm -hmm. uh, uh, at a certain point. And we saw, we saw some lights in the, uh, in, the, in the graveyard, in the cemetery. And we did have a couple of flashlights and um, one of the guys flashed, flashed uh, his light and we saw some movement. It could have been our imagination, but whatever. We saw some movement. Um, we, uh, ten of us walking as tightly as we could. <laughs> if you can imagine that. Uh, you know, ten guys walking um, as close as maybe four people naturally would walk together. Uh, we, went up, we went over there and, uh, and there was a uh, a coffin set a fire and this was um, spring of 65 I believe it was but it, it was on the front page of the uh, Chicago Tribune uh -huh. and uh, we went out there into the graveyard and one of the guys was saying this is where I saw that guy disappear and when he flashed the light over there there was like 7 out of the 10 that saw something there and three of us weren't paying any attention. I have to be—I have to admit that I'm one of the three that really wasn't watching when the guy just haphazardly uh, shone a light to, to indicate where he saw some movement when we first came up. And uh, the seventh square that they—they they saw something, and there were uh, two or three uh, 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 
markers knocked down, and um, it could have been just, you know, uh, random um, uh, vandalism or whatever it was. And then <clears throat> shortly we were joined by uh, by another car that just happened to come out there, and we didn't know these people from Adam. It was two guys and two girls who also had heard, heard some stories. We saw the lights, We saw, and we went over to the uh, coffin that was burning, um, we told them what we had seen. They, had, the uh, the two new couples, said that they had seen movement also. And just at that point, uh, the um, sheriff's police came in because I guess that area is uh, patrolled by the sheriff's police. Uh -huh. And um, they were going to arrest us, and you know our hearts were in our stomachs and everything else. Well, one of the one of the guys that we were with, uh, his father is uh, uh, the uh, or at that time was chief of police of a. Uh, a suburban town out on the south suburbs and uh, it was him who got us out of all the trouble but uh, when we uh, explained to the sheriff's police and there was about four or five of the uh, sheriff's police that came out and we told them about these lights that we'd seen and everything and it was the same guy that had the uh, lantern uh, shown the light again he was indicating this is where we saw it and there was there was something that the cops saw, and the, the cops wouldn't even go out there. Hmm. The cops wouldn't eat, would not even go out there. And it was at that point that they started to um, believe us that you know we didn't have anything to do with with the uh, was the coffin still the, burning? The uh, disturbances in the graveyard, and uh, they telephoned the uh, the one uh, kid's uh, father to ascertain that he was indeed. Uh, 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 chief of police in the suburban mm -hmm. town that we were from, and uh, and um, accidentally we, one of the fellows who was driving happened to have a couple of shovels in his, in his trunk, which is was stupid because they really checked everything mm -hmm. the cops did, and uh, this really put us behind the eight ball. But when we when the one fellow was just demonstrating with his uh, with his lantern, mm -hmm. this is where we saw the lights. Did you see at it this that time? Point, at that point, it was like, all right, fellas, you know, if we catch out here again, uh, you're in real bad trouble and everything, but right. why don't we all get out of here at this point? <laughs> and uh, we all did, but including was, them. I'm curious, was the, co was, was the coffin still burning at the time? Yes, that it was. The only thing that was, uh, that was it was a terrible, wow. uh, it was a very, very terrible smell. And the only thing that, uh, that was still glowing was the, uh, uh, the hinges. You know the the metal hinges on the uh, on the uh, coffins. Uh -huh. That was the only thing that was uh, that was still there. Hmm. And it was, um, as I say, a very very terrible smell. Now this the second time though that you looked, did you see something that time? The second time. Unfortunately, no, I didn't. I yeah, I don't see very well, <laughs> and also um, I'm not one to just um, just look naturally. You know, I've I was scared to death. I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. what, what My dad was mm -hmm. a doctor. You know, was a doctor in, in the you same You were thinking about reputation. Uh -huh. yes. <laughs> but um, it, this was, um, you know, and um, we've never talked about this. The ten of us, we, we came back, we were so scared, um, we just never really talked about it. Hmm. I tried to write the story about five or six years ago and, uh, um, you know, tape everybody's version of it. It was just, I, I didn't think anybody would believe us, so, you know, I, we, we've never talked about Are it. Are you still in touch with any of these fellows that were with Oh, him? yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the guys still got the clipping from the, uh, from the Tribune. And what, what was the clipping about, and what's the story you get into? It was on the front page. It said grave, grave disturbances in south suburbs or grave disturbances in, uh, in suburban uh, cemetery. I'll say it was 65. It was there definitely was, spring. There certainly was enough going on back about that time. Uh, it was a 19... 65, when I was attending Gage Park High School, that uh, so many of the students would have to go out there at night, and that's when mm -hmm. we first heard about it. Uh, when I first heard about it, uh, really uh, brought up as a very, very special place was back about that period. A lot of stuff going on there at that time. The particular um, place, it, how long has the cemetery been there? Since the 1840s. Since the 1840s. And there's still a stone there dated 1848. Mm -hmm. There apparently were some going back even before that time. So maybe stories have been circulating for generations. Oh, very definitely the stories go back for some time. The whole area is quite uh, quite unusual. Uh, not only the cemetery proper, but from the disappearing car stories, uh, 
uh, either side of the cemetery uh, along 143rd Street, all through that area. It's a very bizarre stretch of woods and a very, uh, very unusual site. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, one of the sites on your tours? Actually, I used that on my first tour, the, the ghost tour that I ran years ago, and I don't don't utilize that at the moment in any tour. Mm-hmm. I may well go back to it. It's uh, uh, something that's been cropping up again and again in conversation recently. People ask me about that quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Brian, I want to thank you very much for your can call we, uh, this morning. Can we have him hold on? Yes, and, uh, I want you to glad hold... to uh, uh, take your number off the air if you would, and I'll give you a call on that. I'd like to talk to you further. Okay. Okay. All righty, hold on. I'll put you back in touch with Linda. Appreciate your call. In, in passing, and I know we talked about this off there, there are people sitting at home saying, oh, wait a minute, how in the world do you go about photographing a ghost? Do you have to have multi-million dollar equipment to go out there and find a ghost and capture it on film? No, you actually don't, and uh, for some reason it seems that uh, uh, cheaper camera equipment is often perhaps even better than more expensive hmm. and elaborate stuff. I have friends who are... Uh, professional or semi-professional photographers and we've tried infrared photography a number of times. Infrared is extremely tricky. The problem is not so much with my photographer friends who are quite good at using infrared film but usually it's botched up in the laboratory mm. and uh, sometimes it's it's hard to uh, get the film processed properly. Often it's very hard to get the film processed properly uh, but Polaroid film, Kodak film, uh, 35 millimeter film, just about any uh, kind of camera has the potential of picking up something. Uh, usually when there's nothing visual, when there's nothing visual to the human eye, I mm -hmm. should say, there's nothing there that can be seen. But if you go to a known haunted site, try a number of photographs, you may be lucky, you may catch something on film. Mm -hmm. And it's happened, for instance, at Bachelors Grove that we talked about earlier. Many people have caught on film, on Polaroid, color film in particular, mist-like shapes uh, looking like fog or mist, and yet there is nothing visible to the human eye at the time that it uh, is caught on film. Mm -hmm. This happens again and again, and although uh, some explanations have been put forward by people, so far no rational explanation, natural explanation has worked. Uh, and a friend of mine who discovered this phenomena, I believe he was the first person to uh, discover it, at least he's the first person to publicly uh, uh, state that he has come upon this, is an Oak Lawn man named Tony Vasey. Tony discovered this in 1974, brought it to my attention. He was out with a Polaroid SX-70 color camera by his side. The camera apparently brushed against a branch or a twig or went off by itself, perhaps. Whatever the reason, a photograph uh, came out, uh, developed before his eyes, and as he looked at the film, was a little bit disgusted because obviously the film was defective, the camera was defective, because it showed a, a big blotch of white mist in the center of the picture, but nothing was there. Nothing was there at the spot. Well, to make a very long story short, after shooting film there with that camera and having brought the camera to Oak Brook to the Polaroid uh, uh, corporate headquarters to have them examine the camera and the film, they said, it's not the film, it's not the camera, it's something outside the camera. Uh, it was not defective film, not a defective camera, something outside the camera was the cause for that. And since that time, many, many people have been out there trying their luck. And if anybody in uh, any high school students listening want a good science fair project uh, for mm -hmm. this year, may I suggest that you try some experiments in psychic photography. And the place for you is Bachelors Grove Cemetery. Good morning, Johnny. I'd like to talk to Richard about Bachelors Grove. Uh huh. Uh, back in 1939, my brother and his boyfriend rented the. Uh, it was called a beer garden at the time. Uh huh. And we used to go out there every Saturday. And you know, for the life of me, I can't remember anything ghostly outside of it being dark all the time. <laughs> when did that all happen? One of the stories about the ghosts uh, yeah. begin? Well, when I first heard them in the mid-60s, they were quite prevalent, quite popular. So I'm sure they would date back sometime before that. When did the beer garden shut down? Well, it never made much money. You know, 1939, 1940, it was sort of times like today. And uh, in about, uh, my brother and his boyfriend gave it up in the early part of 41. Well, they were actually involved in promoting it? Oh, yes. Uh, they rented it. They owned it. Uh-huh. And we used to go out there. Naturally, I was a sister. I got it for nothing. I was going out <laughs> with my husband. We used to go out there dancing and everything. Do you have any old photographs of the uh, area? I may have. I'd have to dig down, but I, I could look. Uh-huh. And uh, we used to have, uh, there was uh, the benches outside with the tables, you know, picnic tables. Right. And we used to walk out there, and I remember one night, it was uh, 
before I was married and I was going out with my husband and uh, I got awful angry at him because he walked out with this one girl and uh, uh, outside of it being so dark I can't remember anything ghostly about it. So you don't remember hearing anything ghostly at that time period, no, 1939? No, hmm. mm. Now when you were out there, uh, did you grow up in the area, that particular area? Well, uh, I... Uh, you were there all your life? No, I was southwest side of Oak Lawn. Uh-huh. And uh, my brother was one of these fellows that at the time, you know, he'd get his figures at anything. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe his partner, I think that his parents or something had to do with the ownership of it. I remember his name. Mm-hmm. As far as the pictures are concerned, I'm I'm wondering earlier, we were talking about looking closely at, at uh -huh. pictures. If, you know, there might be something... Uh, rather unusual that your trained eye could pick up on. Well, I, I would be interested just in obtaining photographs, copies of any photographs that uh, you might have, just for my own uh, collection of material uh, of, of these sites. But um, you're right, Johnny. When you, when you look at old photographs, there's always the possibility that uh, you'll notice something that you did not notice before. You will be able to notice and spot something of a ghostly nature. And that's happened time and again. Uh, people go back to old photographs mm -hmm. and then find something that uh, they knew wasn't there before. And the funny thing about photographs, photographs are a strange thing. The old belief among certain Indian tribes that if you take someone's photograph, you steal their soul, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think necessarily they were too far off base. Photographs are very, very strange things. Yeah. And they often seem to almost age like wine or fine wine or fine mm -hmm. cheese, I suppose. And that sometimes things develop, actually develop later on photographs that were obviously not there before, but as the photograph ages, then something shows up, something pops up that was not there before. Mm -hmm. well, if you want to dig down deep, you might come across some fascinating stuff. Uh, I would like you to check back with me, Anne, if you do come across some of that material. I will. Would you do, I'll that? do that? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate You're your welcome. call this morning. And as you were saying earlier, Richard, in documenting these stories, you like to get every possible piece of information, substantial um, information that uh, oh, kind of fills out the story. If you right, will. because you never know where the where the key to a certain uh, mm -hmm. occurrence may come from. Uh, if I can just get off a little bit off the track mm -hmm. to give you a bit of background on that, the Robinson family burial ground. It's 25 minutes after checks in. Uh, you have a particular question or comment about Bachelor's Grove, Pat? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I took a picture about, or not I, but a friend of mine, um, amateur photographer, mm -hmm. took, took a picture at uh, Bachelor's Grove. Actually, my sister and him took, you know, both a couple sets, a couple rolls of film. And we put them away then because there was nothing abnormal about them. Mm -hmm. And we took them out only about a month ago. They were in like a little footlocker for I don't know how long. And we knew they were good when we put them away. Mm -hmm. And when we took them out, one of the pictures of a tombstone, we took, it was a full, the whole picture was just one tombstone. And right now, as it is, half the picture is like white. And the tombstone is gone. And the other half is still the tombstone. Mm -hmm. And the line that would normally separate them is like a line, uh, like a picture of fire. And it's really freaky. It's like it's burning itself off, and there's nothing wrong at all with the finish of the picture. Now, did you just write to me recently about this? Uh, my sister did. Ah, okay, right. I just, I had that letter on hand to answer here in a day or so when I get the chance. I have a uh, friend who is a professional photographer and who is... Uh, uh, my photo analysis man, so to speak, and I would certainly like to have him see that. So I'll be responding to your letter, and we'll get together and uh, hopefully be able to find out just what's going on with that picture. Mm -hmm. Can you oh, determine mm -hmm. the name on the marker? Uh, yeah, I have it here. Mm -hmm. uh, what I do with it? Uh, there's three names on it. It's like a family. Uh, Shields. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Jim Shields, Sarah Shields, and the other name is burned off. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, is this a Polaroid picture? Uh, it was taken with a 35 millimeter. A 35 millimeter. Yeah. And it's a uh, color or black and white? It's color. Color. And it's uh, a regular glossy print? Yeah. And about how old would it be? Uh, about three years now. Stored away, and as you recall, this is, is, this is a brand new aspect of the picture. Yeah. 
it, they were fine when we put them away. We were really mm. disappointed. That's fascinating. Well, I always uh, spring all kinds of things on my uh, photo man, uh, Bruce Melman. He's probably listening in tonight. And uh, this sounds like a job for Bruce, and I'll... Uh, I'll be in touch with you about that, and uh, we'll take a look at that and see what we come up with. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot for listening, Pat. Appreciate it. With recording ghosts on tape recorders or, or um, VCRs. Uh huh. Oh, VCRs. No, I haven't haven't heard of that. But uh, recording uh, ghostly voices on tape is a interesting phenomena that's been uh, uh, bandied about quite often in recent years. Here in the Chicago area, Bachelors Grove, once again, is a place where people have uh, supposedly been successful at it. Uh, at the moment, a tape that was made there and uh, a voice that repeats what sounds like the word minna, which is interesting because it was recorded on a grave next, on a gentleman's grave who was buried next to his wife, whose name was Minna. Mm. Uh, it's currently uh, with my good friend Joe Trioni from Loretto Hospital and Joe is a real authority on voices in the tape phenomena and he has studied with Dr. Peter Bander of England who is a very very uh, interesting fellow who's done a lot of work on this and has published two books on the subject that's one case at the moment that's being investigated and uh, uh, over the recent years I have been uh, sent a number of interesting tapes with some unusual voices on them and uh, um Although uh, nothing really conclusive, uh, I guess, can be drawn from them. They certainly are uh, quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, tapes, when you get a tape, you get into a very, very uh, uh, easy area for... Well, fraud is a possibility, but most of the people I deal with are quite sincere. Not so much fraud as much as just mistaken uh, mm. uh, interpretation of what you've got. Yeah. So if it's you have a, to use a, your imagination. If it's a to cricket, yeah. or if it's a frog, yeah. or if it's a jet overhead, or what the noise in the distance is, and of course at night when most of these tapes are, are recorded, sounds travel such a great distance right. at night that uh, uh, it's very very hard to be absolutely sure. You can't really have test conditions in the open mm -hmm. at night. You can't have perfect conditions because just the nature of uh, sound and the nature of uh, uh, recording in the open, uh, recording in the open, uh, recording in the open, uh, recording in the open.